Hello. Welcome to software testing. And we're going to start today with uh, the course introduction. And I'm gonna, I can hear myself through my own, even if it's muted. Sorry. OK. So I'm Daniel Tall. And And I can still hear myself. Awesome. That at least means that the sound is working. Sorry. And let's try again and see if I can hear myself or not. That seems better. OK. So the content of the course introduction is that I'm going to present myself. The course content, the schedule, the assignments, a little bit about the course literature, something about registration, perhaps. And then you have an opportunity to ask questions regarding the course. and. This is me, um, and I'm Daniel Toll. So I'm a programmer. I'm a passionate tester. I once was a game developer, and I'm also a researcher in computer science. Um, so you've probably seen the course homepage, but if you haven't, this is the link to the course homepage. Uh, and we're not, we're not having any uh, Moodle uh, course page in this course. We're just using this one. Hopefully, you will manage to find the information you need. If you don't find the information you need, you ask in Slack. Uh, you should have already received a welcoming email from me, uh, welcome you into this course, giving you a link to uh, the um, study guide which should have provided you with most of the information that I uh, intend to give you during this first part. But as you might know, there are a lot of students on this course. There are 122 students registered right now. Uh, there are students from Kalmar sitting here in front of me, some of those, and also students in Bekhe that I met yesterday. And there are also online students from online programs and also that are just taking this course as a freestanding course. The, um, in the schedule, there are lectures scheduled, like today. Uh, most of you will watch these lectures on YouTube. Um, and they are normally recorded, but I don't take um, special precautions to record them myself. They are record sent on YouTube, and they exist on YouTube directly after the lecture has been given, more or less. And um, wanted to give most of the lecture from Kalmar, but since we are moving uh, in December or something, uh, I'm also going to give a couple of lectures from Växjö. Uh, so you guys who attend the lectures here in Kalmar should check your schedules so that you're not all alone here. You could, of course, sit here and watch the lecture on the big screen if you want to, if someone uh, organizes that. That could be a cozy evening, and you can laugh at my mistakes and stuff like that. Uh, otherwise, um, most of the communication, I want that to go through Slack. And uh, hopefully, most of you know Slack by now. Otherwise, if you don't know Slack, you should register with your uh, course, your, your uh, um, student email address. I think it's, that is how it's done, right? And then you have access to a, a room in Slack where you can discuss this, this course. So most of the questions regarding assignments, or, uh, uh, regarding the schedule and stuff like that should happen on Slack. I will also communicate through Slack on important information that you need to have or need to uh, get in order to complete the course. So you need to follow the information flow on Slack, especially the information from me. Um, we have two students, uh, Therese and Kenny, who will um, do 
online tutoring on Slack. Uh, they will guide you through the assignments and help you to clear up the mistakes when you read an assignment and you don't understand what I want you to do, you ask them on Slack. Do that in the, in the open channel so that everyone can participate and be polite, ask questions there, also answer each other's questions, uh, be, um, be helpful, don't share solutions, so don't copy, copy code or something to some other student, don't give away your assignment. Um, there are special rules during the the assignments are, uh, over this. Um, yeah, so this, there are two, two online tutoring sessions each week on Slack. I guess most weeks, perhaps there is a somewhat difference exactly around Christmas, I don't know. Uh, but check the schedule, it should be tutoring sessions. There are also tutoring sessions on campus Växjö, uh, but there are no uh, tutoring sessions here in Kalmar. Uh, you can, if you need, to see someone about and talk face to face, you can go up and talk to me. Uh, hopefully you know where I sit. Okay, um, there are a couple of examinations. Most deadlines of those are in the schedule. I think the assignment free deadlines are not in the schedule. There are reasons for that. But those all deadlines are in the study guide. So take those dates uh, um, in the schedule, uh, from the study guide and put them in your calendar. Make sure you have time before that to work on these assignments because these assignments take time. Uh, especially assignment two, uh, assignment one part two takes time. Uh, assignment two takes time. Assignment three is a bit faster perhaps. Um, yeah. Um, make sure that you Keep the deadlines uh, and do the assignments before the deadlines. Hand in the assignments before the deadlines according to the instructions on the course web. Okay, what is this course about? First goal of this course is that you should, after completing the course, on your own automa use automated testing techniques. You should know how to use perhaps JUnit or some other unit testing framework. Uh, and that is examined in the first assignment, assignment one. Uh, you should be able to plan, document and conduct testing of software. Uh, you should um, uh, critically evaluate software testing literature. Uh, that is assignment three. Uh, and then you should also present in-depth te testing research and that is sort of connected to that one. Uh, that is also assignment free. And then you should be able to explain basic terms and principles that is examined through the exam. So today's the second part, the actual lecture for today is starting on the uh, basic terms thing. Uh, you should be able to explain the role of testing in software development that is more or less assignment one, two and the exam and explain the relationship between testing and software quality that is mostly the exam. Uh, get a question. Uh, where uh, is it possible for an online student to talk to Daniel Tall in private? Since we are on campus, we cannot just walk up there. So uh, there are scheduled tutoring times. So if you have questions on the assignments, you can, during the scheduled tutoring time, talk to the uh, tutor instructors about the assignments. Mm -hmm. Should you need, um, for some reason, some private conversation with me, uh, perhaps you're unable to complete the course according to the rules of the course or something like that, you get sick, something like that, um, get kids, you need something, whatever, uh, then you, you can contact me and then I prefer an email to me first and then we uh, schedule an appointment. But that is not for discussing the assignment per se. That is something that you do for like private personal reasons. Uh, so I want most questions regarding the assignments, most questions are like the most common thing is that many, many students ask the same questions about the assignments. Could be the assignment description is a bit unclear on some topic, then you ask this in the public channel because everyone can both answer and uh, contribute to this one. Okay. Uh, these are the assignments. So the first assignment is about unit testing. There are two parts of this assignment. So the first one you should start with today. 
Um, the uh, deadline for the first assignments is November 16. Uh, so it's quite close. It's next week, right? Uh, you need to complete the entire assignment before November 16th. Uh, you're supposed to learn unit testing in a specialized uh, computer science education tool called CS Quiz, Computer Science Quiz. It's really a tool for programming. Some of you know CS Quiz. Uh, you will do some unit testing um, in CS Quiz um, and you get tutoring through C CS Quiz. So they, there are instructions and there are um, more or less practice tasks and then you do uh, two, two, <laughs> two uh, um, ex examination uh, tasks after the practice task. Uh, the language of choice is, is PHP in CS Quiz. Uh, if you don't know PHP before, there are a couple of practice tasks for that. If you don't know PHP, then I want you to start today and not on November 15. That will be too late. Uh, approximately, I would like you to plan for 20 hours of work for the first assignment. It probably does not take that long, but it can. So if you run into trouble, I want you to start early and use the tutoring sessions that are planned in the schedule to ask for help. So start today, get a couple of, get some experience with this. If there's some trouble, then ask during the tutoring sessions or ask in the open channel and perhaps someone can help you. Um, the second part, uh, the first part is mandatory for everyone. You need to complete this to get grade E in that assignment. Um, the second part is a test-driven development project. You can do the actual project in pairs. It's actually quite good to do this as a pair programming practice. It's not mandatory to, to work. You can do this individually. And some of you perhaps don't know anyone to like pair program with. You can, if you want to use Slack as um, um, a way of finding people. Please pair up with me. Simple question. It's totally valid to ask that question in the 2DV610 uh, uh, channel. Uh, you're supposed to write a, a sm small project, read the assignment description. This is way more advanced than part one, but it's also for higher grade. So if you complete part one, you have an E. If you want a higher grade, you should complete part two. Um, the, it's, part one is automatically examined, part two is oral exam with me. And there, I think these oral exams are in beginning of December, somewhere, somewhere around the mo Kalmar movement thing, so it could be a bit uh, chaotic. But my planning is that everyone who chooses to do this, the part two should be able to register for or book a time with me for, for that. Uh, where we are, how we do that, I don't know right now, but there will be some way of booking this. Okay, the second assignment is called system testing, and this is where you get a given source code by me, a legacy source code, and you get also get a small scenario. You're supposed to test this system that you get uh, thoroughly, and you're also going to plan how you're gonna test this, you're gonna make test cases, you're gonna do, conduct the testing according to your test plan on this system, and then you get a test report and a conclusion. And then you're gonna write all this down, and you're gonna send this in through a peer review system that some of you have already used, right? Um, that first part of that, um, part one of that, is a group effort if you want to. You can also do that individually. And as before, if you need a group, you can ask other students on Slack for, to, to, to team up with you. Um, the second part of that is that you're going to peer review test plans or pe these, these artifacts that other students have written. And that's an individual effort. Uh, so it's a two-part uh, assignment. It's quite good to read this. Test, uh, test plans, it's quite good to read other people's test cases because much of this is communication and in order to be a good communicator we need to read other people's artifacts. We need to also, when we're writing these, 
we should write these with in mind that someone's going to read this. Uh, but there are uh, a lot of instructions for this. Read up on these instructions. And the third assignment is testing research. Here you're going to find a scientific newly written paper, I would say within five years, um, maximum five, perhaps a bit further um, uh, in time if you find something that you're really, really interested in. Uh, but you're going to read a scientific paper. You're probably going to need to read it a couple of times because they're, they're special in their language. And I've written a couple of questions with information that I want you to extract from this uh, scientific paper. And then you're going to present this in a five minute video. Uh, most students do a small, small short um, slides presentation uh, and we're, you're going to put that video on YouTube and then you're going to comment on at least two other students' videos. And you're going to comment in a way that we can see that you actually listened to the entire video. So perhaps a good comment is that you ask a question, a follow-up question on the content of the video that you watched. So this, uh, these are the assignments. They're, um, assignment one, part two is pretty big. Assignment two is big. So you need to spend time on this. It's not what you do two days before the deadline. It's what you do a couple of weeks before the deadlines. And then in January, we're going to have an exam. And the exam is mostly on the book and on the lecture contents. What resources do you recommend to quickly learn PHP? There are um, tasks within the tool for you to learn PHP. Some of the students have already done this in a previous course and you can just skip those tasks. The only tasks that you're mandatory is to that are mandatory is to um, is the examination tasks, but it's strongly recommended to do the practice before the examination. Okay. Uh, what is the maximum size for a group? Uh, it is very explicitly um, told on the assignment instructions. So read the assignment instructions, the rules for each assignment. Yes. Uh, I, I think like four, perhaps for assignment two, uh, for assignment one, part two, uh, it's maximum of two students. Uh, the the uh, the study part, or where you work a pair program, and then there are individual examinations. Uh, assignment two, part one, is somewhere around four. But check the, the course page for that. Okay, the course literature. Uh, we have foundation of software testing uh, by Edita P. Mathur. Um, Let's get the book. And then we have Kent Beck, Test Driven Development. The first book is mostly during the examinations. Uh, so lecture content is sort of based on this book. Uh, the second one is assignment two, no, assignment one, I mean. But it's over also overlapping. So during assignment two, you could be doing unit testing. And actually in the, in the legacy code you get, there are tests. So check them out. A big hint. Okay, and then there are some video lectures and lecture contents, and you can find those under lectures in this on the course page. And I'm going to ask you in the end of the second part of this lecture to view two of these uh, rec pre recorded videos, uh, pretty old. So, any more questions? Is it possible to do A2 in a group of three? Yes, it is possible. Sounds good. Let's start with the first lecture. Okay, so this lecture is called Basics of Testing. And the intent with this lecture is twofold. The first thing is that, okay, I'm gonna give you some examples that have motivated me to be a better tester. Some stories, some bugs I've found in, or experienced. And problems with this myself as a programmer and as a tester. And really what I want is that for us to start to build a language which is common between you and me so that we can communicate about writing tests and t testing products and stuff like that. And we're also gonna do a, a couple of definitions. So here. I once aspired to become a game developer, and this was the first game I 
wrote together with Tobias. It's called Time Breaker. Time because you're traveling through time to break 3D structures we built in an editor with, which I built. And these uh, structures are animated. Actually, the game is 2D. What was in innovative at the time was that the game is actually 2D, but the things that you're breaking, the bricks, the, the truck here made out of bricks, is actually 3D and animated, but you're actually interacting with a plane of that, the plane that you're seeing. So, so the ball can uh, bounce off these wheels and yeah. So it's a pretty simple game. We wanted to start a game studio. We had big dreams for this and we wanted to build a simple game. So let's start by this simple game. It was pretty well received in the end, but somewhere in the, after a, a year of implementation, we pretty much had the gameplay set. We pretty much had uh, levels, of, I think in the end we like had 150 levels or something like that all constructed in my homemade editor, uh, animated, um, yeah. But I did not dare to release this game. Not because the game was boring, it was okay. And, um, but because we had a bug. And this bug's severity was pretty, pretty bad. Have you heard about blue screens? <laughs> Uh, some, sometimes we call them blue screens of death. And that is because if you get a blue screen like the, the one on the left, or you might restart your computer and you don't know if it's going to start with the information that, that it had before it crashed. And if I'm responsible for creating a game which blue screens 20% of the market's computers, it's not a good thing. So um, thankfully, I had one of these computers. I bought one of these pretty cheap laptops, I think 13,000 Swedish kronas or something like that. And it had this latest iteration of Intel graphics card. And if you had the driver that this uh, computer was shipped with, which just happened to be around 20% of the market, um, something 14.10, um, the driver, um, then the game could crash. And it happened pretty soon after startup. So the, the game was loading, it was showing our loading logo, and then it blue screened. Um, so we didn't dare to release the game because we didn't feel confident enough in our product. Will we get sued? That was an actual really relevant question for us. So we needed to do a lot of testing. And, it, and this, this, this problem did not disappear. It was not easily found. It was actually something that I, I, I contacted Intel and discussed with their engineers around this because they knew something about that, but they really didn't have a solution for it. Um, I learned a lot about drivers and I learned a lot about memory movements or, um, image memory movements from when you load an image into the memory of the computer and then it's going to be loaded into the memory of the graphics card and stuff like that because it, it was uh, something called deferred loading. Um, it took me six months and it was horrible because in order to, to know if the bug was there or not, I had to boot up my computer, I had to run the game and if it crashed, I knew that it had the bug still. If it didn't crash, I didn't know anything more than I knew before. I just had to shut down the game and start it again. And if it crashed, then I knew that I had a bug. But if it didn't, I might have removed the bug. So I, I sort of cut away parts of the code. I, I tested my game over and over, over, over again. Tried to learn about what is causing this. And finally, after six months of debugging, after pulling my hair out and didn't want to become a, a game developer anymore, I learned about this deferred shading and I learned how to circumvent it. Uh, and the fact is that if you load a texture and directly after you load that texture, you don't load the next texture, you're using that texture. You're actually drawing one pixel uh, in the corner or outside the screen somewhere with that texture 
a texture is an image, right? It could be like the eyes of that little funny dude over there, um, or the color of the, the wheels or something like that. Um, then the bug won't appear because you have actually loaded all textures and there are not deferred loading to, uh, until you, you, you draw uh, the screen. Um, so I, I did that. I was pretty proud of myself finding and understanding the software and, and hardware enough to, to remove this bug or circumvent it, really. And two weeks later, ID Software. Do you know ID Software? They released Quake Free, the source code to Quake Free. And I was happily reading, oh, these are my heroes. I want to read their code and stuff like that. And two weeks after I found the bug, I find the same solution in their code. Uh, that was people on the other side of the earth that had my solution. Okay. But what we learned is this. We learned that testing is that we, I needed to build information, knowledge about the behavior of my product. I need to know that the bug was removed in order to, to be confident enough to release this one. So testing is is building knowledge. Debugging is sort of related to this because it's also about building knowledge. Uh, we want to understand the current state of the, uh, of, the, of the product, the current behavior of a product, and we need that information in order to make a decision. If we don't need that information, then it's wasteful, but I needed that information in order to dare to release the game. And it actually sold quite a few copies of that game. We also learned that determinism is important. My problem was that m when I started the game or tested my game, it sometimes started fine and sometimes the bug appeared. And I didn't change the code in between. I didn't really change any information in a loaded file or something like that. I just started the game and it just was timing dependent if the bug appeared or not. And this is called a flaky test case. So if you have a test case that behaves like that, sometimes it succeeds, sometimes it fails, uh, then you have a flaky test case. Uh, we also learned that, so determinism is important. We want our test cases to either succeed every time or fail every time. Uh, we also learned that to build these tests, I needed to learn a lot about the system. I needed to learn a lot about Operating systems, I need to learn a lot about graphics card, drivers. It's messy business. We need to understand things in order to be a good tester. Um, yeah, and the test itself needs to provide good knowledge about the problem, like precisely which part contains the fault. So I needed to like cut the source code in half and then run the game without that half and then if the bug appeared I knew that I, okay it's not in that half of the code. Um, and in the end of this slide there is a, a link to a 2016 blog post by Google um, and it's going to tell you a little bit more about flaky test cases so I encourage you to read up on that. It's pretty interesting how many of their test cases who are actually flaky and uh, their efforts to work with this. It's, it's a huge problems for them. Um, okay, somewhat related, another game, and this was never released. And one of the reasons that it was never released is perhaps the bug that we're seeing in the image. So you can all see the soldiers that are walking around in this landscape, really big, bulky space marine soldiers. No, you cannot see them because they are laying flat and they are walking animated, but they're flat below the surface of the, uh, of the ground. And this was not like that the last time we started a game but without changing the code in the implementation, uh, it suddenly appeared that. And it ha just happened that another project had required some change in the common game engine. So we had an uh, engine free, the third iteration of our fantastic game engine. 
And we changed that a bit, and it was a pretty subtle change. It was not a big thing, but it turned every model 90 degrees on the side. Uh, so every enemy crawled around and yeah, you couldn't really see them and probably could shoot them still, but yeah. So we learned something about that. We learned integration testing. So when we're testing, we're not just testing the source code we write ourselves. We're actually testing other people's source code also, or their systems. And the interaction between our code and their. And that is called integration testing. And really, if we find a problem, we need to play a bit of detectives. We need to try to understand where to put the blame. Is it fault in our implementation? Is it a fault in the specification of our implementation? Because we need to have some kind of document, some kind of requirements in order to test. We need to, I'm going to go in depth in this, so we need some kind of uh, either written or some idea on what we want in order to, to know if something fails or, or succeeds. But and we could have a, a problem in the specification also. Uh, but most of the cases that I've told you now is that we have faults in other software or hardware. Could be me just being very defensive about my own code, but just, oh, it's someone else's problem. But um, both of these stories are about that. It could actually be problems with hardware, and perhaps some of you have seen the, the, the little yellow tape and the being with, uh, under it, so on the left hand of the screen. That is the original bug. So in the beginning age of computers, we did not have seven nanometer transistors like we have today. We had relays and a relay is really an electromagnetic switch so you have a, an electromagnet and then you have something that reacts on the electric ma ma magnet field and if you put current through the electromagnet the switch closes and you can put current through that circuit if the electromagnetic is open no current flows it's a zero so one zero one zero um, and in this case the first bug was an actual moth flying and get caught when the uh, electromagnet shut. So the electromagnet was shutting, but there was no current flowing because the moth was in between. Uh, it does not look like it has been grilled. It does not very shard or what's it called. So there probably was not that much smoke. Um, but sometimes we have problems in, in our hardware. I've actually, as a young uh, gamer um, had smoke coming out of my computer. I was like, uh, at that time, there was these sound cards called Sound Blasters. Uh, you've probably heard of Sound Blaster. Name is still existing somewhat, perhaps. Uh, but um, and in the game, there was this sound setting, and I felt, oh, maybe I should try that. Um, and I. I clicked the button for trying out the other sound setting, and I clicked save, and then I heard this weird, weird noise, and smoke was coming out of my computer. So actually, um, um, yeah. So this was sort of a bug that broke my computer, so it could be worse than, than okay. Uh, there is a bug in this lecture too, and the students who watched me yesterday in VEC probably thinks it's very funny that I didn't fix it. Uh, there is a bug because this is not example one anymore, right? So uh, I'm a, a complete nerd. Uh, I built robots or built robots a couple of years ago. And you might have heard, heard about Arduinos, have you? Do you know what that is? It's a microcontroller. So it's a, a small microcontroller, small, small computer, one board computer thing. And you c c connect that to, and to motors and stuff like that, or actuators or sensors and stuff like that. And you can build stuff. So I'm actually um, building my own version of this. Um, and I bought or I intended to buy a, a PTC that is a resettable fuse. A fuse is, yeah, a fuse. 
Uh, and then it's a small microcontroller, an 80 tiny 45. It's the Arduino's. Uh, uh, Arduinos have 80 me mega, and this is the little brother of that. Uh, it's pretty cheap, 20 bucks for a, for a single microcontroller. Uh, it has memory and all, like li very little memory, but still. Uh, and I also asked um, a, a socket for that one. Um, but the funny thing is what I've circled in red, just behind me, um, and that is I didn't need to pay for this. So we have a web shop where people can buy things without paying for them. And we can see that these things have a cost. We can see that above, but the, the total. So it's a plus equation that failed, right? It's um, some multipliers and a plus thing that failed. Fantastic. There can be bugs. Um, it's interesting because I bought a lot of things and I actually used to pay for these. Um, so this is not the normal case. The normal case worked in this. If I added products to the shopping basket, uh, then this, was, this value was calculated. But if I saved my shopping basket, and then emptied the shopping basket, and then loaded the shopping baskets, everything in the shopping basket was added, but the total was never calculated. Uh, so it's very cheap. And uh, I, I actually called them up and, and told them about this and hoped that they would tell me something about the, um, the problem behind, but they never even said thank you. <laughs> uh, but the problem here is that we, we told that this thing here, testing is about building communication knowledge, blah, blah, blah. This one, perhaps, the confidence thing. As a customer, I no longer have confidence in their product where I'm going to spend my money because of this. Actually, I bought things from them after that because they fixed their problems. But, um, but my, my, my confidence was reduced. So uh, the goal of testing is to build confidence in the product. Before, it was the confidence of the developer, me, because I wanted to release my product without getting sued. And in this case, it's the confidence of the end user. Business goals are failing because the end user don't have confidence in the product. And you have probably experienced a lot of bugs yourself that reduced your confidence in the products. And especially like transactions of money. I, have, I had at least two more occasions where I bought something online and there's something wrong during the payment process. And I'm so, so amazed that that these kind of bugs are allowed to exist because it really removes my confidence in buying from these. Uh, and when you're buying things and when you're paying for them, you, then you really, really expect things to work. Or, yeah. Okay. Second motivated example. There are two bugs in this picture. One is easily seen. Let's see if someone can find it for me. How is your user interface testing abilities? Pretty bad, no one is. So is there someone? The scroll bar is over the numbers. Numbers behind board, yeah. So the scroll bar is over the numbers and my problem was that I never tested this with enough data. So I tested it with like less than nine items in the high score list because testing uh, the high score list meant that I needed to run the game and high score every time. And that becomes a bit um, numbing after a while when you need to, to break the old record to get on the high score list. And, and, and so, um, so that was under test. I, I, I missed test cases, but it was also the second bug here. And the second bug is that I'm going to show the campus Kalmar students. The location of the dot is here. And I'm going to show the rest of you is it's here, but actually we show, we're showing the end of the, the, uh, the list. So there, we only have 100 people in the, in the high score list, but 
the scroll bar is in the top. And it's because the actual data behind the high score list contains a lot more. So it con contains a lot of like five, 600 of people who have high scored at some point. And um, I I've just capped the presentation. So I just capped that, okay, I don't show more than 100 um, for some lazy reasons. Uh, it was actually a changing requirement. Some um, producer of this game uh, told me to do this, more or less. And then I just did the easiest fix I could. And then I forgot the other one, which is pretty easy. So changing requirements. The problem is here, when I discovered this was when after shipping. And at this time and point in time, the, the customers were downloaded um, copies of my game as an installer. And it was not like web, web games or it was not, did not really exist any means of updating the game after you release it. So you really, really need to test this. I felt pretty bad about this one. Sorry, Tony and Jesse and Rosa. Those are actual people who bought my game and ended up on the high score list. Thank you. So user interface testing, we're not gonna go in depth into user interface testing. It can be pretty messy. Uh, so user interface testing is a, a lot about this. We need to see if the user interface is working. We need to see if the shortcuts is working. We need to check each screen and make sure that you can uh, scroll the scroll bar and that it's not covering some numbers, whatnot. Um, different, um, this game was translated into a lot of different languages, which I only knew German and English and Swedish. Uh, but in Spanish, I didn't know what, I, I could not really do the user interface testing myself because I didn't have the language skills. Uh, but um, user interface testing is a bit messy. Uh, there are frameworks for this. We can record mouse movements and stuff like that so we can regress, regression test it more easily. Uh, that is testing the same thing again without dying of boredom. Um, but um, yeah, so you, you should check out that, that link. But just think of if we have recorded a test case where we're pulling on this slider or something, um, and then I move the slider a centimeter to the left, then that test case becomes broken because the slider is no longer there. So it's uh, just an example on why user interface testing is messy, but check out the Wikipedia link. Okay, from this, we learned that in order to test our software, we need to test it with realistic data. I should have tested with at least 100 items in the high score list, right? I should have faked that. Of course, I should have, should have faked it. In afterwards, it's pretty easy. But I learned that. Uh, so put in as much data into the system as it's supposed to be used with. And this is something that I want every student to pay extra attention to, because this is the problem that I see in almost every project code that I get to examine, that there is not enough test data in the system so it looks like you have not tested your system, and in many cases you have not tested beyond two blog posts or whatever. Don't feel guilty now, you didn't take this course before the last one. Uh, and this is not actually not that easy. Uh, in order to test something realistic, we would like actual users to use the system as it was intended. In order to create that, we must, as testers, learn how they are going to use this system. And we must mimic that, or we take information from our users if they're already using the system, and we record that, and we use that as test data. But then we have privacy issues. We have problems with names and stuff like that, because the test data might be traveling other paths that are not, that we don't want uh, actual data to be traveling. So we perhaps must, must anonymize that data, we must uh, remove all names, rem remove uh, social security numbers, remove telephone numbers, remove addresses, move people around, and suddenly the data is no longer realistic. Um, okay. Some of you uh, noticed this one. I don't know if this bug was still around when 
some of you uh, took the last course that I gave in software quality. Um, but this is a test case. Um, and at the point I um, let the student conduct testing of a small login system. And this login system was supposed to show the time and actually the day of the week also. So it should be say, saying uh, today, Tuesday, the 13th of October, but in Swedish. But it does not say the day because it's Sunday and some lazy programmer did not read the specification enough on the, uh, the date uh, function. So the parameters I sent, it never sent anything out for day zero, which is Sunday, because or something like that. The first day of the week, Sunday. I did not realize that. Something. OK, um, so there was a bug. And only one out of 65 students found this bug, because this student was testing on a Sunday. All other students were testing on Mondays or Tuesdays. Um, 60% assumed the test case correct. 40% found other problems with the test case. Uh, most of the pro those problems was that in the picture on in the in the test case picture that I gave gave the students for them to compare the the output of the application with, there was another time. So there was an, it, it's like uh, it was not 22, 22, 54. It was like another time. So uh, some of the students felt that, oh, it, it's a failing test case because the image here and the actual output here is different in the time. But that was more or less a misunderstanding, right? Because the, the, the thing behind the actual test case is that we want time to be correct. We want it to be the current date and not the date in the picture. That's just an example of a date, right? So we can have sort of flaky test just because the person who is reading the instructions for the test uh, misunderstands the test. It could be, actually this happens a lot. So the same students did other test cases and on the left you can see these pie charts of the results of how these people tested and the, in the one in the middle is pretty interesting where um, 53 students thinks that this test case uh, is not, uh, is, is, is failing. And three students think that this test case is not failing. And then we have 10 students who think something else. Uh, and this was just validation of HTML. And that means that you need to take the HTML from the application and run in a HTML validator. So what happens with these three students who thinks? So I mean, if 53 students found, find a problem with the HTML, it's probably a problem. There was a problem. But free students did not find that. Why? Perhaps they did not run the validator, right? Perhaps they checked the HTML briefly and just, oh, okay, it looks okay, because it looked okay. And yeah. Okay, um, so why are we having these flaky tests? Uh, I mean, the interpretation of a test case is not clear. Perhaps they thought that was what they supposed to do. Perhaps they did not read the test case fully. Uh, it could also be that, I mean, things that vary. The time of day, the, the timing of the, 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 uh, the, the actual, um, uh, when we started the game, when I started my game and it blue screened, it had, had to do with timing. Um, it could be environment hardware, software things, uh, your browser, my browser, you're using another browser than me. Okay, you have a problem, I don't see that problem. Uh, it could be order uh, in which the test cases were run. So perhaps if you run one test case before another, then the debug appeared. If you don't, if you run them in the other order, it does not appear. Dependent test, test cases. But we could have these ambiguous test cases. I mean, language issues, the words mean something to you, it means something else to me. Uh, it could be, I mean, we're interpreting things in different ways. 
could be test cases that are faulty, that are not working. Uh, I would say that all in all, this is about building information and we're learning as testers. So don't think that you're a bad test because you don't find a bug. That you probably have something that you could learn from someone who found a bug. Um, it's not a sign of bad programmers. All programmers create these bugs. Uh, I do it a lot. Um, it's often the case that the program assumes something, miscommunicated with the specification writer. Yeah. Okay. So some of these information uh, or the things that I've talked about is related to the Oracle. So the Oracle in this case was students. Students decided if the test case failed or succeeded. The student was the Oracle, checked the observed behavior of the application and checked it, does it match the expect, expected behavior. And that is the Oracle's um, as humans, we're pretty good at understanding the deeper meaning of requirements. We're pretty good at um, trying to um, generalize from information. Uh, we're pretty bad at details. We're pretty easily bored. Uh, but thankfully, we have computers and they can also be the oracles. So instead of us, we can have an if statement and a comparison, perhaps. And the if statements that you're going to use in the assignment one is called asserts. Okay, let's take a break. Uh, let's take a 10 minute break.
Så välkomna tillbaka. Och eh, nu har vi kommit så långt så att vi eh, kan definiera ett, ett mål för testning. Då. Så målet för testning är att bygga kunskap. Oh, sorry, I'm, not, I'm speaking Swedish. Uh, Okej. Okay. So we've come so far that we can define the goal of testing. And the goal of testing is to build knowledge about a product. And we build knowledge by uncovering errors made when producing that product. And we want to, to build confidence by doing that in the, in the software by conducting tests and fix things and eventually find fewer faults in the product. Um, if we tested everything, if we could test everything, we run it on every machine, we test it with every input, we test it at any time of the day, any time of the week. If we tested the software exhaustively, if we reached every input in the input domain, Uh, without finding any faults, we could say that the product is correct. But in order to, to by testing, saying that a product is correct, then we would need to test everything. This is not possible. It's for most projects. There are some, some, uh, some school labs on that size microscopic programs where you can do this. Uh, the problem is the input domain and the, 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 many, the, 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 man, the number of, of test cases grows to something that is huge. Uh, so think of this. They, we're going to talk about the input domain soon, but think of this. If we have a boolean as an input for a Of function or method. Then we have an input domain of size 2 because it, we need to create a test case with true, with true as input and another test case with false as input. Then we're done, right? But most of the cases we don't have one boolean. We have like one boolean and an integer perhaps. And suddenly we need to multiply the input domain of the of the boolean, which was 2, with the input domain of the integer. If it's a 32-bit integer, it's like 4 billion. So it's like 8 billion test cases, suddenly. And that takes a little more time than running this lecture. It takes, I don't know, have you even tried to run a for loop with like 4 billion? It takes a while. Not done today. Uh, and it, actually, Uh, mo most applications today don't have just one integer and one, one uh, boolean as input. They have weird inputs like strings. And strings, the number of combination for a, a, a string in like Java is like huge. It's like we're not gonna test all test cases until the universe has ended long. Um, So therefore, we need to find the correct test cases. And there is a lecture in, in the future about this. So um, we, we, I told, told, told you about correctness and, and a correct application. And if, if we want to know if the application works for any input, then we should do something called verification. Then we're not really testing anymore then we should do verification. And verification is possible. Uh, you could have, you need special programming languages, you need mathematical models of your software. And the goal of verification is to show that there is no error for any input. We're actually doing a mathematical proof for correctness. Um, they should have done that when they uh, launched the Ariane 5 rocket because if there are so many values or so many lives or so much money at stake, then it's worth to do verification. Verification is still pos is possible, but not for all domains still. It's some, uh, some things are too complex to, to do verification, but we're getting better at this. We have an awesome um, researcher in verification, software verification, software security uh, at Linnaeus University. 
so you can learn about that in the future. So if you're going to launch a, a rocket and you don't want it to... Uh, have you watched this video? You should. You should. You should. Um, it's pretty funny. This guy's going to be sad. <laughs> so they're starting the engines and we're, oh, it looks like it's blown, but everything is fine. It's going up, it's going up, it's going up. And somewhere here, it decides that a 90 degree turn in Mach 3 is a good idea. <laughs> and it's not. And we have a test case, fa failing test case to prove that. Uh, so they should have done that. Uh, I think there's a funny picture of him in the end. <laughs> Not his best day at work. OK, so if we don't have that much money, and in almost every other case, when you cannot do verification, we do testing instead. So testing <coughs> is that we select a, a few test cases, not an infinite amount, and we do that to uncover errors, uncover f errors that someone did, find the faults, and remove those. And we build confidence in the software. On the left-hand side, there is a screenshot from Age of Conan from 2011. And it shows that, OK, the, sh the horse is not showing, but we can still play the game. No one died, except out of embarrassment. <laughs> and um, yeah. OK. I told you something about specification. We needed some kind of requirements in order to do testing. So on the, le the left-hand side, the uh, software engineer, she has an idea, the cloud above her. And she wants an orange rectangle. Uh, she also wants a, a green circle on, yeah, on top of that, so on that one. So she writes the specification, an, a orange, an orange rectangle, uh, 3, 2.5, a green circle, r equals 1.1. What, what are these numbers? What do we mean with green and orange? What do we mean by circle? r equals 1.1, perhaps radius, but is that centimeters or pixels or these weird E units or EM things? I don't know. Um, someone is reading that. That is the, the uh, programmer on the right hand side. And she thinks while reading the specification, OK, it's this rectangle or box or whatever. Uh, and it's on top of that, of course. And yeah. And then write some code and make some bugs. So the color is not correct, and the position of this thing is not on it. Um, and in order to know if this implementation works or not, someone, perhaps the same person who wrote the specification, is also writing test case and test just one aspect of this because we don't. We only test uh, that okay. The expected rectangle should have this exact color because that is what I mean with orange. And you can see here that the specification is a bit more vague than the test case. The test case puts it very specifically uh, explicit. We put values into this. It's this color. Uh, and if you take a look at these two rectangles, uh, if you take a look at the right one, this implementation one, is it that exact RGB color or not? I would say just given what I know about this system so far, is that uh, it looks OK. Pass. I um, could be wrong in this. I mean, uh, I'm just human. I don't know if it's ex that exact RGB color. Um, it's pretty hard for me to determine the difference between 255.153 and 0 to 255.155 and 0. I, I wouldn't be able to, to tell the difference. I could tell the difference in the green ball or a circle thing. Um, that, that would be easy. We have a missing test case and perhaps a bit fuzzy implementation or spe specification, I mean. OK, so if we have a specification and we have an implementation and we put those over each other, we can say that 
the specification, um, the uh, the uh, um, the cross the the green area is the part of the specification that we've implemented, and that is the correct code, and a part of that contains the problems, the faults. Um, the implementation is often larger than the specification uh, because we add other things. Oh, we need a database. Uh, I wanted to have an Easter egg on Sundays, uh, something like that. Uh, we, add, we add stuff. I, I, I need an admin button, whatnot. It's not in the specification, but we need it. Uh, I want to have this shortcut added. Someone tells you something, it's not put in the specification. Perhaps the programmer assumes something, uh, it should work this way, and then adds things. We call that surprises, but they're, because they're not really communicated in the specification. Uh, this becomes very fuzzy, this image, if, someone, if the specification is only in, in someone's head, right? Uh, it could be written requirements, you understand why it's good to have written requirements when you have this, because if someone just gives you an image in their, from their head and don't give you anything more, then it gets weird, really fuzzy and you really need to communicate. Uh, but we really cannot have faults in these surprises, or can we? We can, of course, have bugs in the surprises. It, it's not what the programmer intended, but since it's not in the specification, we cannot really determine that. Uh, perhaps we should put that part in the specification, increase this, the size of the specification or something like that. We could also have faults of omission, and that is parts of the specification not yet implemented or forgot about or something like that. So, yeah, so let's specify some or define some of the words that we're going to use. So the error is the actual mistake. Error is the mistake in thought or action could be me writing an if statement in the wrong way. It could be me assuming that something is needed or assuming that something works in a specific way and writing code. So I'm doing an error. That error may lead to a fault, not always that it does. Uh, the fault is the same thing that I call a defect or a bug. A defect or a bug may lead to an observed behavior that is not correct according to some specification. Pretty simple, like this. So on the top right hand, we have the specification. The specif specification determines the desired behavior below me, behind me. Um, the desired behavior is what we want the program, how we want the pro program to work. And the specification is also used by the programmer to write the program. While the program is doing that, the programmer does some error in thought or action. I would say that not only the programmer can be the one who's doing the, the error here, actually the person writing the specification could also introduce errors, perhaps not understanding the deeper meaning of the requirements or something like that. Um, but the programmer writes um, um, code and introduces faults, bugs in the, into the code, into the program. The program itself, when we run the program with certain inputs, it produces an observable, uh, observable behavior. We, with this observable behavior, we, it can lead to an observed behavior, is if we have someone to observe it. If you don't run, look at the test result, or look at the, the, the screen, then you don't observe it, even if it's there, right? And someone, the oracle is going to make a decision if the desired behavior is the same as the thing observed. Uh, pretty much everywhere, it, 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 I mean, we can read wrong, things can go wrong, and it's sort of a detective work to be a tester. Uh, if it's the same, yes, then the test case passes. If it's not, it's a failure. And we actually, when we write these tests, we actually want to find the faults. In order to find the fault, we must execute the actual code containing the fault or the bug in order to do that. So we, we, we try to run code which contains the, the faults in order to find this bug. Um, yeah, 
And it's a bit more complicated than that because if we're going to observe a faulty state, then we must have run the code with the fault. That fault must have triggered a, a, a faulty state in the program. And that state needs to propagate through all layers up to the visual, visible thing so that we can observe it. And not all bugs are like that. Sometimes they're just false values in the database, right? And perhaps we're not even looking in the database, or we cannot understand that from the database. So let's define what a test case is. And there are three things that you need in order to write a test case. Um, it becomes four because you need to run the test also. So first, you need a system under test. And the thing, I didn't fix this problem either. Uh, there's a bug in the slides. Sorry, Y means E, E means Y. Um, also on line four, uh, it's 3.2 uh, again. Okay. Um, but we have a system under test, and that is what we want to test. It could be a single function. It could be a line of code. It could be a class. It could be a component. It could be a system. It could be a system of systems, something. What we intend to test. And I call that system under test. Uh, sometimes we hear this class under test, whatnot. I call them all system under test, just for simplicity. And in this case, we have the pow function, x to the, to the power of e. And then in order to test this, we need test data. We need test input. And in this case, x is 3 and e is 2. Uh, you see the bug in the slide, right? And then the third part is that I need to know what I expect. And that is sort of the thing I get from the desired behavior, right? The desired behavior of the pow function, if I provide it with a 3 and 2, is 9. So I expect it to be 9. I want you, when you write your unit tests in assignment 1, to use this vocabulary. So call the system under test, S-U-T, call input, input, call the expected value, expected. Uh, and then we actually run the function. It should be f3.2, 3,2, and we get an output, and we call that the actual output. Uh, and the actual output is what the system under test produces under these inputs. Uh, we want that to be deterministic, to be the same every time, un unless we get flaky tests. And in this case, we get almost 9, 9.000001. Could be uh, some kind of approximation error. Uh, could be a faulty if statement. Could be many things. Um, but this is what we get. Um, but actually, if we have a user interface and we observe this value through that user interface, perhaps we are capping the number of decimals. So we only show the two here. So we're not seeing this bug. And the oracle, the one who decides if this is correct or not, must decide, is 9.00 the same as 9 or not? And it looks the same because we're only seeing the surface of the system, but it's actually not. If the observable behavior was the same as the actual output, uh, then perhaps the answer would be something different or perhaps not. It could be that 9.000001 is OK. We can live with that. It's, it's fine. It could be that if this is the difference between taking a 90 degree turn with a multi-billion dollar spaceship or not, then it's not, right? So, um, and that is the responsibility of the oracle to, to decide that. So I've, I've talked about correctness. I talk, talked about input domain, but I've not talked about reliability. So correctness was, just to remind you, uh, that a program is co considered correct if it behaves as expected on each element of its input domain. 
the page reference here uh, is from an old version of your book. So uh, I'm guessing it's almost the same definition now in the new book. I have not looked it up. Um, so yeah, so that was okay. exhaustive testing. Uh, often most, most often not possible. Instead, we should do verification, right? Okay, the input domain is the set of all possible input to a program P. It is known as the input domain or input space of P. So if we take this POW, which takes two flo flo floating point numbers, let's assume those are 32-bit numbers, then we get 2 to the power of 64 size of the input domain. It's huge. So we're not even exhaustive testing that one. Uh, the re reliability is the probability of successful execution on a randomly selected element of its input domain. This means that if I, from this 2 to the power of 64, if I take a number between 0 and the highest number of 2 to the power of 64 and select a test case in between there, randomly enough times, how many of these are succeeding? And hotspot login, I don't want that. What is this? Uh, yeah. Uh, how, what, what is the, the number of test cases that are succeeding out of all those? So um, if we have a Boolean input, and it should, responds, uh, it should respons respond, um, uh, it, it is correct every time we say true, as Boolean input to the program, uh, and it, it's failing its output every time we say false to it, then we have a reliability of 50%, because we work on 50% of the input domain. Um, but this is also a probability, um, and not all inputs are equal, so be a bit careful. Think a bit about that at some time. We're also going to discuss these. Uh, different testing types. So there are many different testing types. On this is quite standard vocabulary, and you've already heard about user interface testing. Uh, so let's talk about black box testing. Black box testing is what I did with POW. We had no idea why POW um, outputted 9.0000001 one because we have not looked at the code. We have no access to the code. We write our test case using a mathematical understanding of the POW function. So we look at the code as a black box. We don't, we don't open the lid. We don't look at the, 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 uh, uh, the, uh, the things inside. Um, we generate tests mostly from the specification, from the requirements. This is sort of the opposite of white or glass box testing. If we have knowledge how the code works, like, okay, um, I'm, I'm running my unit tests and I have a coverage me measurement which can see what lines of code are run during the tests and I'm, I'm not currently running this one where it returns a new model user with some post things. Um, so let's create a test case in order to reach that line. Then I'm doing white box testing. When you're doing assignment one, you're sort of doing both of these. If you're doing assignment one part, part two, then you should write your test in black box mode, and then you should use coverage measurements to find the missing test cases. Um, there's also something called model-based testing. Model-based testing is sort of in between verification and testing. So it's the mix. In model-based testing, we have a, a, a mathematical model of how the system works. And we use that model to derive tests. And we run these on the actual system to see if the system fulfills the model. Um, we're not going very deep into this. There is a, a YouTube video where you can watch, and this is explained a bit more. I've already talked to you about user interface testing. 
So let's talk about something else. Let's talk about smoke testing. What I did when I ran my game and looked for crashes, the blue screen was actually something called smoke testing. Smoke testing is that um, if the system ends up in a faulty state, which my system did, then it should crash. And I could actually put things in my code so that it crashes more if we're in faulty states. I could put if statements that checks the input somewhere and perhaps throws an assert or throws an exception. And I want that to happen because I want the system to be fault, fault proof. And if I do that, I can just run my system. And if it ends up in a faulty state, then it crashes. And I call that smoke. Uh, so smoke testing is that, OK, and actually random testing also. Uh, we, we try to run at tr as much of the system as possible. We try to run our code uh, as much as possible, exercise it, and, uh, and like, um, it's like with the dough. You're, you're working with the dough, and you're doing everything with the dough, and you have, uh, uh, perhaps you're not when you're baking. It was a bad example. Just forget about it. Um, you, you want it to, to crash. Um, so smoke testing, you run the system as large uh, part of that as possible and you look for smoke. Could be things like I start the system and it never stops. It's using 100% CPU because we have a while loop or some, somewhere. So I understand by running the system that something is wrong. Uh, this is closely related to exploratory testing that you're supposed to watch a video um, until next week. It could also be that the system does not produce any output. Quite common if you're programming PHP that you get a white page back. Thank you for the feedback, PHP. Turn on, it could be asserts. Could also be exceptions, error messages, log messages, output minus one, all the things that in to tell us that the system goes wrong. So the, the testing technique is smoke testing. We run the system. Let's look for, look for smoke. Random testing is sort of similar. Let's run the system, perhaps as large part of the system as possible, but with random input. So it could be like, um, let's create uh, something that clicks everywhere in your game. Like a monkey banging on the keyboard. And if the system breaks, then we've found a bug. Nice. Could be a bit smarter than that. Could be that we devise the randomness so that uh, we're creating not complete random input, but we're actually like, if you have a user authentication system, we're actually creating random users with random usernames and random passwords. And if the system crashes, then we know. Okay. When we're doing testing, we're looking for information. We intend to build knowledge about the system. And we can do that in many different ways. S testing is super wide. And um, we have talked about some things here. Uh, we've talked about mostly dynamic features. Like on dynamic features, we need to run the system in order to, uh, to find these. It's uh, reliability, for example. Uh, reliability we've already talked about. We, we, we see uh, for how many input cases the, the, uh, uh, the system provides the correct answer out of. Um, could be other things like usability testing. We're checking the user interface for usability issues. Could be performance testing. It could be stress testing. Uh, it could be us checking that the user interface has a consistent design. It could be everything, but the system is running. Um, it could be completeness. Let's make sure that every requirement is implemented. Uh, it could, but testing can also be static things. Like we examine the code as part of our testing to make sure that we fulfill our quality requirements for the code. But perhaps we should have structured, maintainable code. Uh, we want testable code. Perhaps we want to know if, if we're actually testing code and how large part of the code are we testing when we run our tests. Uh, we want to know if the code compiles. So let's run the compiler on the code. If it does not, 
then we fail, right? Um, could be we need to find out, is there any documentation? Is the documentation correct? Is it complete? Can someone understand it? All these things. It could be code reviews. So testing is super wide and quality assurance is super wide. So we're only touching small parts of this during the course. And I'm sorry, but I'm not a magician and we don't have super much time and there's super much to learn. And for these reasons, both in assignment one and assignment two and in assignment three, there is a lot of freedom for you to find things and work with things that are within the scope of testing. And you can always ask, Am I, is it okay for me to work with this stress testing in assignment two? Yes, it's okay, fine. Tell us about that tool. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've already said something about at least two, three, four of these I've already told you about. But the different test levels. Unit testing I've told you about. It's when we test a single unit of our code. It could be on different levels, unit testing also, but mostly it's one method in one class. And we write a unit test for that method. Uh, we have also talked about integration testing. So we have one component, perhaps our game, and we have another component, our game engine, and we test to see if this works together. And in my example, the, the uh, soldiers 90 degree turned, we had a failure in the integration testing. The game engine worked, the game worked, but those two in combination did 90 degree soldiers. Um, the system testing is when I run the entire system. Um, so we install the system perhaps in sort of servers, the, the kind of servers it's supposed to run on. We, we uh, um, run, we, we build up the system from all its components, we connect those components, we start up the system, we run perhaps manual test cases or recorded test cases on these. Uh, we run the entire system really. Uh, regression testing I've also said something about. Regression testing is that we run tests again after a change we have done or we run the same tests again after running the tests, perhaps, just to see if the tests are flaky. Uh, so regression testing is we, we um, yeah, run same tests again. Could be boring, could be deadly boring. Uh, therefore, we need to automate things and hopefully you're gonna learn how to do uh, some of that here. Uh, it's quite common to hear about beta testing. And beta testing is when we have a version of the program, we think it works pretty good, but we want to see how are our intended customers or users uh, going to um, experience this system? What kind of requirements do they feel is most important? Uh, we, we test it with actual users instead of just professional testers. Uh, nowadays, uh, my impression is that beta testing is not as important as it was before we had, when we have these waterfall uh, uh, development processes, this was really important because we really needed to test things in the end to see if the developer did things good. And, uh, but if we have agile testing, we say that, or agile process, we want the customer in our process all the time, so we're sort of working with the, with the end user all the time during the, the all phases of, of the software development. And beta testing today is perhaps more of a marketing thing. We let some of our users, gamers perhaps, try out a game or a system before the others. They feel special. They create their vlog posts, they scream into the microphone about how good everything is and they feel happy because they're helping us. But really we knew about that bug, that disappearing horse months ago. We're not gonna do anything about it either because we're not making any more money for that. Okay, uh, but that, that is just my um, assumption or because of a story I've heard from the gaming industry. 
Okay, uh, finally, acceptance testing. Acceptance testing is what someone who's ordered a system from programmers, perhaps you, are doing on the system to know if the programs have done what they asked for. So we create all these requirements, we create these test cases, and then we do acceptance testing in order to find out did they do a good job or not, of what is implemented, what is not implemented, what is, omi uh, omission, what is omitted, and what is not. That was a lot of different definitions. So I want you to, to check out the book, and some of these definitions are better explained there. Um, but except for reading the book, I want you to watch James Bach on exploratory testing. I want, it's a pretty funny video. He's a pretty funny guy. Uh, he's also a beard, and uh, us beards are, it's an awesome Swedish word, uh, roughly translated to boy guessing. Um, it's kiljissa. And some, uh, some beards are doing a lot of these, and some, some software development things or develop, development gurus are really these beards who are inventing religions. And he's sort of doing that a bit. So I want you to, have to, to watch this video but with a bit of critical eye. But it's a funny video. It shows a lot about testing. You can learn about exploratory testing in this one uh, and what testing could be and what it should not be, uh, perhaps. And perhaps you want to do some exploratory testing during assignment two. It's fine. You can do that. Uh, and he's telling you a, a, a bit of his tricks. Uh, I also want you to watch uh, a very fine lady's uh, presentation. It's a bit old now about agile testing. It's a Google tech talk. She's awesome. Uh, and she's passionate about testing. And both of these people are passionate about testing. And that is why I want you to watch this. Um, both are a bit old, don't matter, a bit bad quality perhaps. I mean, um, take it for what it is. It's two hours of your time lost. And then I want you to start on assignment one. Plan time to start before the deadline, way, way before the deadline perhaps, so that you can ask for help if you should you need it. Okay, so uh, very warmly welcome. Have you any more questions? Warmly welcome, welcome to the course. Yes. Uh, are the books mandatory in the course? So I think I think that uh, you should get both books at least as a PDF. Um, I, I think it's a good idea. You can probably, if you squeeze your way through all this information and search online and whatnot, uh, the the problem with doing that is it might be that I'm using another vocabulary than you are. So if you're taking other sources uh, and reading other things, then you might get uh, a, perhaps a correct image of reality, but you're using other words, and that could be a problem during the exam. So uh, I won't say that the book is, uh, because I don't know if the book is needed or not. But um, the lectures, as I see them, is a way of meeting you, a way of communicating my view of testing to you, and it's a complementary thing to, to reading the books. You, I would recommend reading the books. Assignment one, especially for higher grade, I would recommend you to read the book. It's a short book. It's a good, funny book. Okay. Uh, I think that's it. That is it. Thank you for today.